In this segment, we'll explore how people came to realize that in the past, much of the Earth's land was covered by ice, which was the first widespread recognition that climate change could occur. By the early 1800s, geologists had begun to interpret the origin of European landscapes and quickly ran into problems while doing so. Although many surface features were obviously due to water or wind processes, other features seemed to have no apparent tie to either. Mysterious boulders covered northern European landscapes. Much too large to be moved by water or wind, these boulders had obviously still moved, since their composition was very different from the local bedrock. So geologists ended up calling these boulders erratics, after the Latin word erraticus, which means to stray or to wander. And across much of the northern European landscape, the ground was covered by sediment, which consisted of a very poorly sorted mixture of many different sized grains, all tumbled together. Now at the time, geologists already knew the water sorts sediment by grain size, and that wind is even better at doing so. Consequently, these surface deposits could not have formed the wind or water transport. So how did they form? Well, at the time, geologists did know something about icebergs, enough to know that icebergs also carried rocks and sediment held in their ice. And scientists knew that the sediment or rocks would be deposited on the seafloor if the icebergs melted as they drifted overhead. So they made the assumption that the poorly sorted deposits that covered much of northern Europe had been deposited through melting icebergs, which had drifted over the land at a time when sea level was higher. So geologists called these deposits drift, a term that's still in use, although we now realize the deposits did not form from drifting icebergs, but from immense moving ice sheets. But why wasn't the idea of past ice sheets recognized right away? Why did early scientists instead believe in floating icebergs? Well, at the time, most scientists were convinced that this image was not correct. They believed that ice did not cover the Arctic Ocean, but instead open water and open polar sea existed over the North Pole. If you're familiar with American history, the existence of this open polar sea was tied to the quest for a Northwest Passage, a passage that would allow ships to sail between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The idea of an open polar sea was so strongly held at the time that maps were made of it even though no one had ever seen the sea. But why would the concept of an open polar sea be so widely accepted? As it turns out, people had reasons to believe in it. At the time, people knew that the centers of frozen lakes often hold open water, so it seemed to make sense that the Arctic Ocean would freeze over from its outer edges inward, leaving a central area of open water. And captains of whale ships often reported they had seen open channels in the sea ice, with water flows coming from the pole. They also saw flocks of birds flying out from the pole region. While we now realize that birds simply fly over the Arctic as part of their long-distance migration routes, just as modern aircraft fly polar routes to move between North America and Eurasia, at the time, people underestimated birds' ability to fly long distances. So they thought the birds had to be coming from an open polar sea, much as ducks and geese fly off the inland lakes. Ships also caught whales in the Pacific. The boar embedded harpoons that had come from northern Atlantic ships. Again at the time, we did not realize just how far whales migrate. So the simplest explanation appeared to be that these whales had gone from the Atlantic to the Pacific by swimming under the sea ice, which meant that there had to be an open area of water so the whales could surface to breathe. And the pole was assumed to be too cold for snow to form. If polar air could not hold water vapor, people thought there would be no snow, and hence no ice to cover the water. Remember that at the time, Greenland, with its massive ice sheets, was almost completely unknown to geologists. And no one at all knew that Antarctica even existed. That continent had still not been discovered. So in the absence of other reasonable possibilities, geologists turned to the idea that an immense deluge or flood had covered much of the Earth, with innumerable icebergs floating in the water that melted to drop unsorted drift deposits across the land. As far-fetched as those ideas now appear, At the time, scientists knew, or thought they knew, that most of the northern continents had recently been covered by iceberg-rich seas, and that the North Pole was an open sea only rimmed by ice. At least until this guy came along, Jean-Pierre Pardoun, who doesn't look like a scientist because he wasn't one. Pardoun was a part-time carpenter, hunter, and guide in the Italian Alps. But he was smart, knew the mountains, and was a good observer. So well before 1815, He recognized that mountain glaciers had been larger in the recent past, reaching down their valleys to deposit the scattered erratics. 
and carving striations or scratches into valley bedrock. Peridun argued that glaciers had once filled all the Banshees Valley where he hunted. Since he had never been anywhere else, he wisely did not make claims for other areas. In 1815, he served as a hunting guide for Jean de Charpentier, a geologist and director of a salt mine. Now you do not have to remember these names or dates. I only want you to know the basic idea of how one set of ideas evolved into another. But during their hunting trip, Peradun explained his ideas about the glacial origin of many alpine features to Charpentier, who promptly dismissed them as complete and utter nonsense. Charpentier later wrote, I found his hypothesis so extraordinary and even so extravagant that I considered it as not worth examining or even considering. But 1815 was also the year that Tambora erupted to change global climate. While no one in Europe knew that a volcano had erupted on the opposite side of the Earth, Tambora's eruption did focus their attention on glacial ice. Because alpine glaciers began to expand over the next few years, as Tambora's volcanic aerosols cooled global climate. By 1818, a glacier in Switzerland had grown so much that its ice dammed the stream to create a large glacial lake. From past experience, people knew that if the lake broke through its ice dam, floodwaters could destroy downstream communities. So Nas Vinez, a Swiss engineer of roads, was brought in to try and drain the lake. Now, Vinez wasn't completely successful. He did manage to drain nearly two-thirds of the lake before the ice dam broke, but floodwaters still killed 50 people. However, in the flood's aftermath, Charpentier visited Vinets and brought along his guide, Peridun. And the hunter managed to convince the engineer about his glacial ideas. And the engineer, in turn, convinces the geologist that the hunter was right. That in the past, mountain glaciers had become large enough to fill all of the mountain valleys. And then the engineer and geologist went on to convince Louise Agassiz, a well-known fossil fish expert of their ideas. And that fossil hunter would take the idea to an entirely different level. Although he began as a skeptic, Agassiz converted to the glacial idea, and like many converts, became an ardent supporter. Agassiz in turn convinced Carl Schrimper to come on board, who was actually the person to coin the term Ice Age, and who came up with much of the evidence for a past glaciation, all of which Agassiz took credit for. Although Agassiz did not deserve credit for Schrimper's work, nor for the Hunter Paradun's original idea, Agassiz did deserve some credit for popularizing the idea and giving it a grander scale. Because while Venets and Charpentier had thought that alpine glaciers were much larger in the past, they did not extend that idea beyond the end of the mountain valleys. In contrast, Agassiz and Schremper expanded the concept to propose that all of Europe had once been covered by ice. At first, their idea met considerable resistance, but then other events came into play that helped to lead to its acceptance. In 1845, the Franklin Expedition set out to discover a northwest passage through to the open polar sea. But things did not work out as planned. Their ships were caught and crushed by sea ice, so the men set out to cross northern Canada on foot and were never heard from again. Some of their bodies were first found in 1945, while the wreckage of their ship was not found until 2014. However, rescue expeditions had set out as soon as people realized the Franklin Expedition was not returning. Rewards were posted and several expeditions set sail. In 1853, Elijah Kent Kane led the Grenwell Expedition in an attempt to find the missing Franklin Expedition. And once again, things did not go as planned. Kane and his men ended up being trapped in sea ice for over 17 months. But in that time, they became the first scientific expedition to explore Greenland's Humboldt Glacier, which was the first known analogy for a massive ice sheet, like the ones that Agassiz and Schremper had proposed. People now knew that such huge ice sheets were possible, long before the discovery of Antarctica would confirm that idea. Because of his speaking skill and charisma, Agassiz became one of the most famous scientists of his day by expanding and popularizing the idea of past ice ages. However, it should be mentioned that Agassiz still had a number of wrong ideas. He actually thought that the ice sheets had extended all the way from the North Pole to the Mediterranean Sea. He basically envisioned a world nearly completely encased in ice. And more importantly, he thought that the Ice Ages were a single, sudden, completely catastrophic event. Agassiz believed that the remains of mammoths and mastodons found across northern areas came from warm climate animals who had been suddenly trapped by ice during a mass extinction. A global extinction of all life, both on the land and in the sea, which cleared the Earth's surface for an entirely new creation, one that included humans. 
In 1847, Agassiz had moved to the United States. But even after Darwin's 1859 publication on the origin of species, Agassiz did not believe in evolution, nor that humans coexisted with older life. Instead, he continued to believe that his ice age was God's way of clearing the earth for humans to live on. But despite their errors and Agassiz's personal failings, Agassiz and his compatriots did leave us with a completely new view of the recent past and the realization that the Earth's climate was capable of great changes. But before we get to modern climate change, let's take time to explore how glacial systems work, as well as our modern evidence for past ice ages, which will be the subjects of the next few video segments. <laughs>